Hello, this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high quality racing oil for your two stroke or four, make sure you go to blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. This is Hannah. This is Bailey. This is Butters. And I welcome to the No in the Quest Vault. <laughs> Welcome back to the Motocross Vault. My name is Tony Blazer, and what this video is going to cover is a look back at the history of one of the most popular and iconic off-road machines of the last 40 years, Honda's XR350 and XR400. Uh, the XR350 originally made its debut in 1983. It was kind of a Goldilocks machine that fit between the large, kind of desert-ready XR500 and the smaller XR200 and XR250. The 350 was all new in 83, and it was the first year that they incorporated like the uh, radio four valve combustion chamber head. It was actually a pretty advanced machine at the time, uh, as far as four strokes go. It's interesting that Honda only made it for a couple of years. It only ran from 83 to 85 before they retired it. Honda in 86 refocused their attention on the 250. The 250 was all new, and it adopted some of the technology that was used on the 350 um, in 85. The 85, actually, a lot of people think is one of the best off-road machines of the 80s uh, in terms of four-stroke world, at least. It was a real popular model. I always thought it was puzzling that Honda just killed it after that uh, one-year redesign. I think the 85 really hit the sweet spot in general, but it wouldn't come back until 1996, 10 years later. Honda would reintroduce the midsize XR in 1996 when they redesigned the uh, 250 and 400 that year. And then it would basically stay the same until 2004. Really, there wasn't much in the way of change. There were minor changes, but uh, the basic design stayed the same uh, through its life. That said, the XR was a super you know popular model. A lot of people love it even today. Um, the 350 and the 400 both are, are well regarded. I mean, the, the world of four strokes was really changing in the late 90s there. You got to figure two years after the 400 comes out, Yamaha comes out with the WR400F and the YZ400F, and that really, that was a major paradigm shift. I mean, obviously there were high-performance four-strokes before this, Husqvarna, Husaberg, and some of the others were building them, but they weren't, you know, quote-unquote mainstream. They are more niche vehicles. Um, the Yamaha coming out, the Japanese really committing to making a four-stroke, a high-performance four-stroke, high-revving with all the latest technology, that really was a game-changer. And I think it kind of changed the focus of the XR. I mean, initially when it came out, a lot of people were trying to race the XR 400s. I remember the A Loop made a tank for it. Um, they people were a good buddy of mine here in Leesburg actually had one he was racing in the B class on it. He modded and spent thousands of dollars turning this thing into a, a motocrosser. And it, well, it's kind of crazy when you think about it how much money you were spent to try and turn something that wasn't designed to be a motocrosser into one. But this is real popular for a couple of years. But once the YZ came out, it really kind of put all that on the back burner and the XR kind of continued its life and went back to being just strictly kind of an off-road play bike but great machines and what this video is going to cover is a history of that XR every year and I'm going to do like I've done in the previous ones um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about each year what it did what they changed what have you and it's going to go from its initial a year in 1983 through its demise in 2004 uh, now if you do like this sort of thing i have done a similar history on the xr200 the xr250 and the xr500 slash 600 as well and you can find those videos on my channel i will link them here uh, if you like to check out those as well very similar kind of year-by-year -year design if you'd like to support what i do here at the motocross vault i just came out with some new xr designs i did one based on the 1984 uh, xr 250 which was all new this year and got some of the um some of the improvements that were introduced on the 350 in 1983 uh great looking bikes i love this era the orange and blue and uh just a really good looking motorcycle in my opinion um, i've also have one uh based on the xr 600 which is uh, the 85 design probably maybe my favorite xr of all time that 85 was a great looking motorcycle and and you can find both of those on my Teespring store. I will uh, attach a link, a card in the video, and a link in the description below. So here without further ado is the story of the Honda XR350 and 400 from 1983 through 2004. The XR350 story starts in 1983 with the introduction of the very first XR in the midsize division. Honda had been producing full-size XRs for a few years at this point. The first XRs were introduced in 1979. That first season there is an XR185, a 250, and a 500. In 1981, Honda revamped the XR lineup, adding the new ProLink rear suspension system, which was their single shock design. And then in 1983, you get the third generation of the XR lineup, uh, introduced with an all-new 350 and 500 this year. This is also the first year they went to the flash red color, which is the orangey uh, red plastic, which I love, uh, which was also introduced in the Honda CRs here in 1983. 
this redesign at 83 is complete from the ground up. Uh, both the 500 and 350 are all new. They feature much stouter chromoly steel frames, all new suspension, and a complete redesign of the motors as well. Uh, both of these machines are lighter for 1983. In fact, the XR350 is actually 24 pounds lighter than the 82 XR250 had been. The machine was still no lightweight with Honda claiming a, a dry weight of 249 pounds, but compared to the uh, 250 the year before, it was a significant weight savings. They did that by replacing parts like the engine cases with lightweight magnesium and just shaving and trimming weight anywhere possible. While the 350 and 500 are both new here in 83, there are some significant differences between the two. Uh, the motors both are the first to use the radial four valve combustion chamber design, which Honda had introduced here in 83. And what that was was a uh, four valve head using a very narrow angle hemispherical head design. And what that was designed to do was allow larger valves and a quicker, more even burn. And Honda claimed that would allow the machine to rev higher and produce more power. Previous to this, they'd use a pent roof design, and this is the first year for the um, radial four valve combustion chamber. And this would be a staple of Honda's four strokes for the next uh, 20 plus years, really. Uh, basically until the introduction of the CRF lineup in the early 2000s. That was uh, basically the same design they would use. Now, as you can see, this engine is air-cooled. There's no liquid cooling on it. One thing that is significant between the 350 and the 500 is the 350 this year is a wet sump engine, meaning it carries all of its oil inside the engine. Now, this would turn out to be a, an issue on these motors because that would cause the motor to run very hot. The 500 actually had a dry sump design, which means it carries its oil in a remote tank, very much like the YZ400F would do uh, about 15 years later than this. And that allows them not only to have greater oil capacity, but gives that hot oil somewhere to go to cool. So as it circulates through the frame, it's actually cooled. With all the oil carried inside the motor, it wasn't easy to get that oil cooled off. And of course, being air cooled as well, uh, it's going to be even more doubly difficult. So this first couple of years of this uh, 350 design, they suffered from overheating issues that led to some valve failures as well. They, the oil would get very hot, very thin. They also tended to float valves and what have you. So there were a few reliability issues with these motors if you try to run them really hard. I think if you were easy on the bike and you didn't uh, try to run the bajabbers out of it, it's pretty reliable. Uh, but there were definitely some issues that would be addressed later with this uh, wet sump motor design. One of the other features they added here for 1983 is a dual carburetor setup. Now what that was designed to do was to allow a wider power band with less hesitation. You know, four strokes are always notorious for having that bit of a hiccup, that hesitation if you whack the throttle suddenly. And what Honda was doing with this twin port design was to basically have a one carburetor handle the low speed jetting, and then the other carburetor would kick in at high RPMs when you needed that extra fuel. The second carburetor actually only had a main jet in it. It didn't even have a pilot jet or anything else. So they had a special cam that would allow the, the uh, slides to sync up, and when you got to a certain throttle position, it would open that second throttle uh, opening in the other carburetor to give you that extra fuel you needed at high RPMs. Much like the wet sump motor, this would end up being fairly problematic on these. It's really kind of what the main complaints people have with these uh, early XR350s. The carburetor uh, issue was a pain to jet, and it was difficult sometimes you get the carburetors out of sync, and then that caused all kinds of uh, nightmares. So I think when they worked... Properly, they worked very well, and I think a lot of people you know, swear they could get them to run right, right. But if you didn't know what you're doing, it was pretty easy to screw it up. And I think that was one of the early issues with these uh, XR350s as people complained about. Suspension-wise, the XR350 uses a 41 millimeter uh, Shawa non-cartridge fork. Uh, it put out 11 inches of travel, which was one inch more than uh, the XR500 uh, had had the year before. Uh, again, it's non-cartridge, just a damper rod style, fairly simple, very soft damping as well. Now, a 41 millimeter fork, of course, is tiny by modern standards, but even in 83, that was not the top line stuff. You would On a CR, you would have found a 43 millimeter fork. And even on the XR500, it had a 43. So the 350 this first year gets a, a smaller fork. It also doesn't get the disc brake uh, in 83, which is pretty impressive. You think all even a CR480 only had uh, drum brakes in 83. The XR500 this first year actually got a disc. Uh, the 350, though, had to make do with a drum. So that's one of the main differences between the 350 as well. Uh, it's basically smaller forks. It doesn't have the um, the disc that the larger machine has. Uh, but overall, very similar machine. The, the chassis and what have you are very similar between the two. Uh, the motor itself, 
uh, obviously has less power. It's, I think, 339 cc, so it's actually not a throw, full 350, but this is a good mid-size size, designed for torque more than horsepower. None of these XRs are, like, screamers in the modern four-stroke way. If you're used to, like, a modern four-stroke, you get on one of these, it's going to feel, you know, painfully slow and mellow, but um, at the time, they're pretty torquey, uh, fun machines to ride for sure. So I think, in general, this first year... Good looking motorcycle too. I love the looks of it. As I said, this is the first year they went with the blue seat and the orangey red plastic. Love the styling on this. They kind of hit it out of the park. It looks way more modern than does like the 82 uh, machine. They restyled the fender. The fenders are aerodynamically designed to apparently to uh, put more air to the motor. Good looking motorcycle. I think they're very comfortable too. A good friend of mine had one of these and it was a comfortable bike to ride. Uh, not a powerhouse by any mean, but a, a good first offering for Honda, I think. For 1984, you don't get a whole lot of changes on the XR350. As I said, it was all new the year before. You have the same uh, compression and rebound adjustable ProLink rear shock, which was, I guess, similar in theory to what you would have found on the CR, but of course, much softer, uh, not nearly as uh, high quality of a design as what you would have found on the, the motocross models. Front forks are still a 41 millimeter air adjustable setup. The main thing you find up front, though, is they do get the disc brake for 1984, so you do get a much uh, improved braking. You, a really nice dual piston uh, Nissan caliper front unit on here. You also get a uh, new brush guards on the handlebars. Um, I always thought these were nice. I always ended up putting hand guards on my motocross bikes for riding in the trails. Anyway, so it was nice that Honda for 1984 added them uh, as standard equipment. Uh, they improved the waterproofing on the airbox slightly. Uh, they also uh, made the tool bag more durable. I guess they had some problems with tools ejecting in 1983. And they also changed the chain guide material to be more durable. Uh, other than that, everything else is exactly the same as the year before. The bike even looks basically the same. The only difference really is a little difference on the logo on the seat, but uh, still a really handsome motorcycle in my opinion, and a solid mid-size four-stroke thumper. For 1985, we get an all-new XR350R, and I think by most accounts, this is the year that Honda got it right. Uh, they made a lot of changes this year. And I think pretty much across the board, they were regarded as major improvements. Uh, the engine was new this year. They bumped the displacement up to 353 cc's. They also went from the wet sump engine, which I had mentioned earlier, which tended to run very hot and break down the oil quickly, to a dry sump design like used on the larger XR. Now this allowed them to uh, lower the center of gravity by keeping the motor smaller and carrying the oil down in the frame, and also allowed it to keep it much cooler. So this was a major improvement. Uh, the engine was much more powerful this year. They got rid of the dual carb setup, which most people had not really cared for, and went with a much simpler single carburetor on the 350. On the dyno, the new motor put out a little over three more horsepower and over two and a half foot-pounds more torque. So it was a significant increase in power. It also peaked, uh, the torque peak was actually 2,000 RPM sooner, so it had much more low-end grunt, really, really great off-road power band. The chassis was all new this year. One of the complaints some people had had, depending on where they were riding with the old model, was it was a little twitchy at speed. It was fine in the woods, very short wheelbase and what have you, but uh, if you got it out in the desert or someplace, the 350 was a little dicey. So they lengthened the wheelbase here for 1985, uh, made the bike a, a significantly more stable. They also upgraded the shock. They put a larger shock body on it, as I said earlier. Uh, even though it was a fully adjustable ProLink shock, it wasn't the same quality shock you would have found on the, on the CRs and it had uh, been prone to fade. So the new shock was uh, larger overall, had a little more travel, still fully adjustable. Uh, up front, the forks remain the same 41 millimeter uh, non-cartridge design, although most people had not really had as much issue with the forks as they'd had with the shock in the previous couple of years. Uh, Handling-wise, the bike was, as I said, more stable. Still a great turning machine. These XRs actually were always, um, you know, good turners in general. I think the four-stroke helps weight the front end a little bit with the compression braking. I think many people had an issue with that part of it. Uh, good good handlers in general. Uh, the bodywork was all new this year. The tank is much slimmer. Uh, if you've ever sat on one of the first generation ones, it was fairly narrow at the, the seat, but it bowed out, uh, you know, pretty strongly as you moved forward, kind of splayed your legs out. And for 85, they redesigned it. I love the looks of this. This bodywork is uh, by far my favorite of any of the XRs. I like the looks of this motorcycle quite a bit. And this tank is narrower. Uh, doesn't splay your legs out nearly as much. The seat was also redesigned to be flatter, so it didn't have that kind of scooped out middle. It uh, didn't lock in place as much. They also redesigned the foam this year to be more uh, water resistant. The old one, when you got it wet, it would kind of break down the foam and it would sag out. And this new foam for 1985 was supposed to be more durable. Uh, they also added a, a really trick uh, computer to the odometer this year. You had 
previous ones had a very simple odometer, uh, but this 85 model has this trip odometer, kind of a computer that could be used for Enduros and what have you. Really slick stuff in 1985. This was, the, I think, the only model on the market that had this, this the XR500 and the 350. It was a uh, kind of exclusive. Honda unfortunately ditched it, I believe, uh, maybe a year or two after this, but it only lasted a very short amount of time. It's probably expensive, but this was some really neat stuff at the time. I think a lot of people were really uh, psyched to get it on the new, on the new XRs. I think, again, if you look at any of the tests of these bikes, people loved them. They were really great motorcycles, um, nice mid-sized machine. You know, if you're looking for a bike that's, you know, not not as heavy and burly uh, as the XR600, which was really a great desert sled, but not really very nimble in the trees unless you're Scott Summers, this is a great kind of middle-of-the-road machine. I mean, on the dyno, it put out, you know, a little shy of 26 horsepower, which actually is about what a, a CR125 made in 1986. But um, it, its torque, obviously, was much stronger uh, not going to pull your arms out of your sockets by any means, but great all-around play bike and a real fun woods machine. And uh, really strange to me, I always thought it was odd that, you know, the year after this, Honda discontinued the XR350. They went, uh, took a lot of the technology here that's found on the 85 uh, 350 and put it into an all-new 250 that year and put all their eggs in that basket. Now, the XR250 would, of course, go on pretty much unchanged until uh, 1996. So that was a very successful design as well. But uh, I know for many, many years after this, uh, people lamented the passing of the beloved XR350. In 1996, Honda would finally bring another midsize XR to the buying public in the form of the all-new XR400R. Now, after doing a little research here, it's interesting, I, I read an interview with Bruce Ogilvie talking about uh, the XR350 and how beloved it was a few years after its demise in the late 80s. But in 85, apparently they had warehouses full of them that they couldn't sell. Now, some of that may have been due to overproduction or who knows what, but it is interesting that how that bike kind of got a cult following after the fact, but when people could have bought it, apparently they didn't. Uh, it would take, as I said, nearly a decade for the midsize XR to make a return here, but in 1996, Honda came back with a all-new machine and a very impressive machine. Now, of course, you have to keep in mind that the four-stroke world was very different in 1996, you didn't have the uh, you know the modern racing four strokes out yet. The YZ400F was still a year or two away. So this is kind of considering when you're looking at the thing compared to our uh, KLX 300 or whatever it would have been in the Kawasaki's at the time. Uh, it was a you know pretty impressive machine. Uh, obviously compared to like a Husaberg or some really high end off roader, the XR is you know much more of a play bike than that. But uh, Honda was going for you know capitalizing on what people loved about the old 350 and the very successful 600 with this new machine. So keeping with that idea, they kept with air cooling. It still used the same radial four valve combustion chamber head. As I said, they really just kept this design in use for 20 years. In fact, it still is in use actually. I think the the XR 650L still uses this basic engine design. So very you know successful motor. Definitely not the most powerful design you probably could go with, but uh, stone reliable and a very very a uh, good overall machine in terms of uh, durability and, and compromise as far as power and uh, reliability and what have you. Now, this new machine had an all-new frame. It used a dry sump design, again, carrying the oil in the frame for increased reliability. Suspension is really where you see a major quantum leap forward. Again, the engine is larger this year. It's you know almost a full 400 cc, it's 397 cc, so it is bigger than the old engine, but the basic design is not that much different uh, than the 85 motor. Uh, but the suspension is way better. You're going to have uh, a 43 millimeter fork, so it is larger. It has the same 11 inches of travel as it actually had in 1985, but this new one is fully adjustable, has compression and rebound adjustability. That's something the old one didn't have. It has a, it's a cartridge design, although interestingly, it is a conventional fork. By 1996, all of the motocross machines except Suzuki, who had actually flip-flopped back to conventional forks, um, were using an inverted design. The inverted designs that come in around 89, 90 uh, era and for off-road use, though, the extra compliance of a conventional fork made a lot of sense, and Honda chose to stick with a conventional design here on the XR400. Uh, the shock is the you know their uh, trademarked ProLink design, fully adjustable for compression and rebound damping, and it had 11.8 inches here in uh, 1996. Uh, new body style. I love the looks of this machine. Uh, good looking motor. I like the uh, the overall graphics this year. This generation of XR. This is probably. Uh, my favorite, at least with the white plastic, until they got went back to the red in the early 2000s. Good-looking motorcycle. Um, the suspension was very well regarded at the time. Again, too soft for motocross, uh, but for its intended use, the bike was very good. 
Um, of course, no electric starter. That was a beef some people have now on it. But at the time, most most four strokes didn't come with electric start, so it wasn't a big issue in 1996. Overall, this was a, a very well regarded machine. If you ever ridden one of these, it's super torquey. It's not, you know, it's funny if you look at the test. They're talking about how little compression braking it has and what have you. By modern standards, it it has a lot. But at the time, this was a very snappy feeling, fun to ride four stroke. And a lot of people converted these into motocrossers. You know, a loop. Uh, made a uh, like a replica of the CR tank that you could stick on there that narrowed the uh, narrowed the the riding position. Uh, some people stuck fork braces. Some people put upside down forks on them. They spent you know ten thousand dollars taking one of these XR four hundreds and trying to make it into a motocross machine, which I always thought was kind of crazy. But uh, you know four stroke people, especially back then, tended to be a different kind of lot, and they like to mod the hell out of these things. And a lot of people did try to turn them into racers, but. If used it for its intended purpose, this 1996 XR400 was a excellent off-road machine and uh, definitely a worthy successor to the beloved 1985 design. For 1997, we get a very, very modest update to the XR400. Uh, mechanically, the only change they made was a stronger set of clutch springs. Some people had complained uh, the year before that under hard abuse, the clutch would slip. Um, certainly if you're trying to motocross the bike. Um, and uh, for 1997, Honda upgraded the clutch springs and redesigned uh, the lifter mechanism to improve durability of the clutch. Other than that, the only differences are purely cosmetic. Um, it's personal taste. I actually way, way, way prefer the 96 design. I love the the purple in that. The Overall, I think it looks really great. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of purple CRs, but I think on this XR in 96, it really worked. And for 97, they deleted all that and went with red. Still not a bad-looking motorcycle. I'm sure a lot of people actually probably prefer this 97 design. Uh, but other than that, it's really just the exact same machine it was in 1996. After basically standing pat in 1997, we actually get a fair amount of updates on the XR400 for 1998. Uh, they revised the carburetor jetting, ignition timing, and intake and exhaust systems to improve performance. Uh, they also revised the airbox and cover latch uh, to hold more securely in place. They added a less restrictive muffler with a new three-chamber design for better power output. They also redesigned the Kickstarter mechanism to be more durable. The front fork featured an increased spring rate and redesigned compression valve for improved performance. The ProLink linkage had new needle bearings that were supposed to be smoother. They also were designed to provide a more compliant rear suspension action. Uh, they added a CR bend handlebar, added a more durable right foot peg bracket. Uh, they strengthened the rear subframe and added new Team Honda inspired colors and graphics. Considering the bike was all new two years before, it's actually a fairly substantial update. I mean, I guess mainly you look at it as little tweaks, but the basic design of the machine was obviously uh, the same, but they did add some, you know, pretty significant improvements. Uh, the styling, again, very similar. I will say I do like the addition of the yellow Honda wing on the shroud. Always a big fan of having the Honda wing on the motorcycle. I always think they look better that way. And this does brighten up the looks a little bit uh, as opposed to the 97 design, which I think, you know, with just the red and black, it's a little bit uh, dark and dreary in general. Uh, I know when looking at some tests, when they, uh, the new XR had to go up against like the WR400F, obviously way slower machine. Um, the WR pretty much, you know, roosted past it, but the XR was still competitive. Uh, when they, a lot of the people at the time were taken to putting, you know, bigger bore kits in them or some way to try and hop up the XR. But this basic engine design was never going to be uh, as powerful as like the, uh, the WR, which used a, you know, a short stroke, almost like a road race style engine to provide much more high RPM power. But the XR is very torquey, still very competitive within its own little niche. Uh, you know, it's a woods machine and a play bike, great machine. Uh, but as these newer, more powerful, more advanced kind of uh, motocross inspired machines were coming in, uh, the XR really was kind of getting pigeonholed into more of a play bike, I think, at this point. For 1999, the XR400 was back with only the most minor of minor updates. Uh, the only update listed in their literature is new Honda inspired colors and graphics. I had a 99 CR125. I didn't really care for the stock graphics that year on my CR. I didn't really like them that much on the XR either. I actually prefer the previous couple years to this. Um, the Honda wing is kind of built into the uh, overall graphic design, but I just never really cared for it particularly on this model. But it's splitting hairs. Who cares really? It's all, they all kind of look the same. Um, after the uh, list of minor updates the year before Honda st stood completely pat here for 1999. For 2000, the XR400 was back with another bold new graphics update. 
Uh, but this time, actually, they are boldly new. Uh, this is the first year they went back to the red for the bodywork, and I think it's a huge improvement. This is easily uh, my 1B, maybe. The 96 probably being my favorite, but I love this move back to the, the orangey or red. I love this overall design in terms of the looks. I think this move really updates the looks of the machine. I, I never really care for the white on all the XRs they went with in the 90s. I mean, the only year that it even is remotely to my liking is 96 because of the purple kind of spruces it up a little bit. In general, I think going back to the all red is a better look. And I really like the 2000 graphics on the CRs as well as the XRs this year. It's a good look uh, overall. And that's really the only change. Um, bold new graphics is in the literature is listed as the only change for 2000. For Honda, the problem really isn't the machine, it's the competition, because I would say the WR400 customer, probably not the same customer as looking at an XR400. There may have been some overlap there, but the WR is clearly more of a, um, you know, a racier alternative to the, uh, the XR. But this new competitor from Zuki, the DRZ400, was aimed right at the bullseye of the XR400. I had one of these, I had a 2000 uh, DRZ, and I love that motorcycle, um, and I, I actually really prefer the uh, the way the Suzuki ran. It was smoother. The Honda has more of a, I guess, a chunkier torque, but it doesn't rev as high, and the DRZ is a, has a smoother, longer-pulling motor. It really is, to me at least, one of the all-time best off-road engines ever produced. It's a the, the, the power band is just as wide as Montana on these things. There's no dips and lulls or anything. There's no massive you know, bump and torque or hiccup or anything. It just pulls like a powerful electric rheostat the whole way through. And it's a really good motor. And Suzuki, I think, although the suspension wasn't the, the necessarily the best, maybe on the one I had, I had the dual sport version. It had some cheap suspension, but I think on the actual uh, off-road version, it was way better. And uh, basically Suzuki was, you know, doing what Honda was doing, maybe a, a step above. Depending on maybe what you're going to plan to do with it, maybe the radiator thing was a, a, a you know a detractor. The one thing about the XR was you never have to worry about punching a radiator on the trail or something. But I've I've ridden I've had over 50 motorcycles. I've ridden you know for the last 40 years. I've never punched a hole in a radiator in my life, so I never had that problem. But I suppose depending on where you rode, maybe that was a you know advantage to the Honda. But for the most part, I would say uh, the DRZ did what the XR did only better. Uh, just a basically a more modern interpretation of it. So Honda at this point clearly wasn't, you know, interested in keeping up with the Joneses. I imagine they probably had, at least in the glimmer of their eye, the new CRFs um, thinking that thinking about that way uh, moving forward with, you know, the coming out of the WR and the YZ400F. They had to already be thinking about what their retaliation was going to be. And uh, I think the, they were happy to just let the Honda go on as it was at this point in the XR line. For 2001, we get another wash, rinse, repeat on the XR400. Uh, no electric start, no fuel injection, no radiators, just the same old machine with some new graphics. Uh, I don't really like these graphics as well, but it's very similar. Again, you're splitting hairs. Uh, I think the uh, seat and logo on the tank was maybe not quite as elegant as the year before, but basic machine still a good-looking motorcycle. Um, but if you're looking for bold changes, you've come to the wrong place. From 2002 through 2004, unfortunately, the XR400 would only receive graphical updates. Um, all of these bikes look very similar. I still think the 2000 is probably the best looking of the red XR400s, but none of these are unattractive motorcycles. Uh, 2005 would bring about the all new CRF 450X, which was more of a direct competitor like the WR450 uh, at this point. Um, not really, in my opinion, at least going for the exact same market as the XR. Uh, certainly, you know, based on the CRF450, a much more high performance machine, certainly way more complicated, much more. Uh, you know, maintenance intensive and what have you. So, uh, you know, I think Honda would have been smart to keep making this motorcycle, just do some updates. If they just updated the uh, ergonomics a little bit, um, you know, the tank was kind of wide, the seat was a little scooped out or whatever, compared to some of the competitors, I think they could have uh, just left the motor alone, basically, maybe added an electric start to it and kept selling it for another 10 years. But uh, that being said, Honda, I guess, felt they had reached the end of the line with the XR400, and they were going to move on to uh, different machines moving forward. So, Good machine, you know, certainly a really popular machine today. Uh, people love them, and uh, this XR400 was an excellent machine during its life. So there you have it. That's a look back at the history of the Honda XR350 and 400, machines that are still well-regarded and beloved by many people to this day. I think if you have one in nice shape, it's still worth a fair amount of money. 
Um, I always wanted a 400. I never had one personally. I've had a couple XRs, but never a 350 or a 400. Although a good friend of mine, Lester Carver, had a 350 back in the late 80s. Um, I used to ride that around, and it was a fun bike. You know, it definitely way torquier than like my 200 or my buddy's 250. It definitely had a lot more grunt. Wasn't you know a particularly fast motorcycle, uh, but in the woods they were super fun. Stone claw reliable, and that's the main thing about XRs. You know, they're all about fun and not having a lot of maintenance. You don't have to tear them apart and rebuild them every year and stuff like that. And uh, I do think those are important machines to have. You know, you don't need every motorcycle, it doesn't have to have the latest technology, it doesn't have to have a million uh, dollars worth of fuel injection and all this other crap on it. It just needs to be fun, easy to maintain, easy to ride, and inexpensive. I mean, the sport needs, you know, nice, inexpensive motorcycles. I bet if Honda produced an XR400 to this day, if they just took that motorcycle, it would sell like hotcakes. So, in any case, I hope you like this sort of thing. If you do, if you could share, like, subscribe, leave a comment. That definitely helps the algorithm. Uh, share out this video to other people. and helps people find my channel. I certainly appreciate the support. Uh, you can find my merch available at the Teespring store. Uh, just search the Motocross Vault on Teespring. It'll show up as well. So until we meet again, this is Tony Blazer from the Motocross Vault. Keep the rubber side down. Peace.